everybody. I'm Dan, and today we're going to be talking about the keys to anaerobic digester stability. In this presentation, we're going to be covering a number of things. There's quite a bit of content to cover, but we're going to go through a bit of anaerobic digester basics, uh, symptoms about whether your digester is healthy or not, causes of poor health, how to prevent a digester upset, operational changes, and Aquafix products, how to handle an upset and managing upsets with Aquafix products. To start out, we have our anaerobic digester basics. These are just a few things that you need to know to understand anaerobic digesters. We're gonna focus on generally how they work. We're gonna talk about a couple different types of anaerobic digester systems and a few ways in which they differ from each other. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about good and bad things about anaerobic digestion. And I want to cover nutrient requirements as well, particularly focusing a little bit on trace metal supplementation. The anaerobic digester process is a four-step process. Sometimes people will call it a five-step process because you might break uh, bullet point three here into acetogenesis and acetogenesis, which sound very similar when you say them, but are actually slightly different processes. But starting off with the actual most important step, which is disintegration in a lot of cases, where you're breaking down large chunks of solids into small, fine particles, uh, you need to do this to give the particles enough surface area for the bacteria to begin excreting exoenzymes, which allow them to hydrolyze these particles into components which they are capable of ingesting, mostly soluble compounds like uh, fatty acids and smaller amino acids and things like that. Uh, after that, you have acetogenesis and acetogenesis, which is the process of converting long chain fatty acids into short chain fatty acids, uh, like acetic acid, and then converting that into acetate specifically. And then after that, you have methanogenesis, which is kind of the most finicky point of anaerobic digestion. The methanogens require the most specific conditions, and there aren't a lot of different methanogens present in an anaerobic digester. So the key parts, of course, are agitation. You need enough movement going on that your solids are able to break up and that your bacteria are able to interact with the substrates in the anaerobic digester. After that, you have your acid-generating bacteria, which perform a lot of the work converting everything into acetate. And then the methane-generating bacteria can jump in and begin producing methane primarily from acetate. However, I just want to go over, there are two types of methanogen groups you'd refer to. Hydrogen uh, trophic methanogens use hydrogen and carbon dioxide to produce methane. They serve a vital role, but they don't produce as much methane total as the acetoclastic methanogens, which use acetate. Hydrogenotrophic methanogens are preventing an accumulation of hydrogen in the system, which can be detrimental to the acetoclastic methanogens. So there's some advantages and disadvantages associated with anaerobic digestion, particularly if you're comparing it to aerobic digestion. So I'll start with the disadvantages. They're expensive to build and design, uh, would be the main reason people wouldn't start putting anaerobic digesters in everywhere. Generally speaking, that's why, at least when it comes to municipalities, you usually won't see anaerobic digesters in the very small plants. Once you start to get to like a medium size, you might see a couple pop up, but you'll still be primarily focused on aerobic digestion. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is um, you don't get a lot of benefit from gas production if you don't have enough waste substrate coming in to actually generate a lot of electricity. And also these smaller systems don't have as stable a waste stream, which anaerobic digesters require highly stable conditions. So these smaller systems with a less stable waste stream are more likely to lead to anaerobic digester upsets anyway. The cost of entry tends to be a little bit restrictive in many cases uh, because it doesn't cost a whole lot more to make a bigger digester than a smaller digester, but the investment is high and most smaller plants won't have one. Anyway, the other thing is they're mostly going to be removing carbon. They're not that efficient at removing ammonia and phosphate, which means typically they're coupled with some sort of aerobic treatment as well. So of course the upsides are, if you have one that's running well, you don't need a lot of energy input because the gas can produce a fuel which can be used for heating the digester or generating electricity in the plant, saving you a bit of your um, energy money. And there's, of course, no aeration or anything input to the digester. You have some general mixing, but that's fairly efficient on the whole. So if your digester is working well, they tend to be pretty cost efficient. They also do a good job at reducing solids. And anaerobic digesters do have a nice benefit in that they're more complementary to an activated sludge process than an aerobic digester. 
And what I mean by that is the communities of bacteria in an anaerobic digester are capable of degrading some of the substrates that are not degraded efficiently aerobically. And a lot of these compounds, especially like fats and that sort of thing, are kind of a struggle to degrade aerobically. But you also can reduce solids like dead bacterial cells more efficiently, plant matter, that kind of thing will be broken down more completely in an anaerobic digester, which means your total volatile solids destruction will be higher. So just a couple of the basic conditions you require for an anaerobic digester. Um, typically, you'd either have a mesophilic or a thermophilic digester, which each have their own specific temperature ranges, which you can see on the screen. Um, you also have a general pH range for optimal methane production, which is 6.8 to 7.2. Now, we see a lot of digesters being run above 7.2, like you know 7.5, 7.7 range. You still have pretty good methane producing activity in that higher pH range. Uh, you do have an added risk, especially if you have a lot of ammonia in your waste stream, and I'll talk a bit more about this later. Uh, once you start hitting about a pH uh, or a pH 7.5, ammonium begins being converted to ammonia which are two different compounds. And ammonium is generally non-toxic to anaerobic digesters, but ammonia can be toxic. When we talk about nutritional requirements, we typically be talking about both macro and micronutrients. The macronutrients, of course, are carbon, phosphate, nitrogen, and you could say maybe iron and sulfur. It kind of depends on who you ask. There's not a real clear cutoff at that point. The nice thing about iron and sulfur is they're not directly toxic to any of the organisms in the system, which means you can add about as much iron as you want to a system, and you can have quite a bit of sulfur and still have perfectly effective anaerobic digester function. However, there is one caveat there with sulfur. You have a competing community of bacteria that competes with the methanogens specifically, which is the sulfur-reducing bacteria, which are producing hydrogen sulfide. If you have a lot of hydrogen sulfide production, you tend to limit your ability to produce uh, good quality methane. And the higher your sulfur levels, the more likely you are to have these hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. So the higher your sulfur levels, the more iron you'll likely need to supplement into your process. And a lot of that iron will just be there to precipitate out excess sulfur. I had a couple interesting discussions recently about whether it's likely for an anaerobic digester to be nitrogen deficient, because we're looking at a COD to N to P ratio, which typically an anaerobic digestion they're wanting around a thousand to seven to one to around 250 to seven one it's not super precise whereas aerobic is fairly well established to be somewhere between 100 to 10 to 5 to 1 but you're going to have a little bit of a different community of bacteria and you might have different waste substrates which require a little bit of discrepancy say higher levels of nitrogen or lower levels of nitrogen but we haven't seen a lot of anaerobic digesters be nitrogen or phosphorus deficient because really they just need a ton of carbon in most cases. Moving on to the micronutrients. Again, I'll add iron and sulfur because they're kind of borderline, you could say. If you have 1,000 to 7 to 1 to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 isn't that far removed from the 1 for phosphorus. So um, they tend to require quite a bit more iron and sulfur than any of the trace elements, which are usually about less than one-tenth of the concentration of iron you will need in your system. Uh, many of these actually can become toxic if your concentration gets too high, so it's good to be careful with them. And a lot of them are present in most well-balanced waste streams in adequate levels for anaerobic digestion. But one thing to note, you could have adequate levels of trace metals, and it might be inhibiting your quality of methane production slightly, but you'll still be above the 60% range, which I'll talk a bit more about later. But the closer you get to the optimal levels of trace elements, the better your gas production will be and the more efficient your anaerobic process will be. Um, trace metals, we could include cobalt, molybdenum, nickel. There's a lot of others like zinc, copper. All of these require usually less than one ppm, and a number of them can start to become toxic if you just have a couple ppm of soluble um, micronutrients like copper or something. So you have to be a little careful with them, particularly in supplementing. The nice thing is it's not always easy to overdose these trace elements because in many cases they will precipitate out fairly readily. So we have a lot of people who come to us and ask about trace element supplements, so trace metal supplements. 
And there are a number of companies which produce custom trace element blends, and they'll take a sample of your waste stream, and they'll perform metal analysis, and then they'll tell you what metals they think you need, and they'll give you a blend which they say has that kind of metals in it, which many of them do a pretty good job at this. But one thing I do see that's a little bit limited is, um, I do encounter a number of them that are doing this now. But one thing that's a little limited is if you do metals analysis in your anaerobic digester, you don't really know what is soluble and bioavailable and what is not just by taking a digester sludge sample and a digester influence sample and performing metal analysis on it. So there's a couple of different methods you have which you can improve on this with, uh, one of which is filtering the anaerobic sludge sample and taking the filtrate, analyzing it for metals content and seeing if there's a discrepancy between the filtered and unfiltered metals level. Now this isn't perfect. Some of the soluble metals may not be bioavailable and some of the metals that get removed by the filter may still be somewhat accessible by bacteria, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what um, how soluble the metals are, and that can give you a pretty good idea of what metals may be beneficial to supplement. Uh, with our work, we tend to not make a lot of these custom element supplements, but we do produce our own trace metal supplement, Biogas 1, which we've designed to be very safe in terms of the metal concentrations present, and it tends to be converted to a bioavailable form, and it's kind of a good general starting trace metal supplement, and it will work in many of the cases we've worked with, but if you're finding you may have a more unusual waste stream or something with some industries, it is worth doing a complete metal analysis to see what sort of metals you need. But we have had a lot of cases where biogas one works just fine and it's a little more straightforward than getting these custom blends. And then you have the added difficulty of verifying that the custom blend you have is actual appropriate for your site. So make sure if you're getting a trace element blend custom made by somebody that they have a good reputation for producing uh, good quality trace element blends and they do their homework in figuring out what metals you really need. Going back to thermophilic and mesophilic digesters, there's a couple discrepancies here. I had a uh, solids retention time recommendation for both of these, which is about three times longer in mesophilic digesters than thermophilic digesters. So thermophilic digesters are much faster. Thermophilic digesters also produce a higher quality uh, sludge product and they get faster destruction of filaments. In mesophilic digesters, I talk a little bit about filaments later on, but they can take as much as a month to start breaking down filaments, which might be coming in through waste activated sludge or other sources. And they can be contributing to foaming and that kind of thing in the mesophilic digester. We have our mesophilic digesters, which have greater stability on the whole. So the thermophilic does everything faster, including crash and burn horribly. So your mesophilic digester is able to hang in there and won't have quite as many upsets. It can handle a little bit wider discrepancy in waste stream. If you have a little bit of temperature fluctuation here and there, it may be more resilient than your thermophilic process. So thermophilic processes, because of this, we only see in very large systems because the large systems have very stable waste streams. We have a couple types of anaerobic systems, which we've been asked about a decent amount lately, and I wanted to go over a few of the differences between the two. And these are complete mixed systems, which is kind of your standard, a lagoon and a UASB, which could be considered a complete mixed system, but it's an upflow system and it's producing granular sludge. Starting off with our complete mixed system, which many of you I'm sure are very familiar with, is our standard system. It usually has some sort of recirculating pump mixer, or I've seen some mechanical impeller mixers. You have near continuous mixing taking place, though a lot of people do run the mixing somewhat intermittently to save a little bit on energy and also to prevent foaming events in some cases. But this mixing, like we talked about earlier, allows for pretty good disintegration of solid waste substrates. So your hydrolysis is able to function fairly well. These are pretty good at handling high solids content and you find them a lot in municipal waste streams because they tend to do reasonably well at handling waste activated sludge being fed into them. So you can contrast this with lagoons. Uh, lagoons are very expensive to build and still offer effective treatment in many cases, which is why they're very prevalent, especially in a lot of food industries, that kind of thing. But you're really limited due to mixing and mixing can be reducing your treatment efficiency so it'll take longer for your treatment to take place. 
You also can develop channeling, where if you don't have a lot of mixing, you might have solids pooling at the side of your anaerobic lagoon, and then you might have a channel where water flows straight through in the middle, which can reduce your treatment time, which can give you very inefficient treatment. So you have to be kind of on the lookout for that. Sludge accumulation can be difficult to deal with, and that's the channeling is one of the issues there. But these can be used to collect biogas, but that tends to be more difficult. And temperature control is more difficult in lagoons as well. It's difficult to have a effective heating method, which will evenly heat the entire lagoon. So typically you'll see temperature discrepancies in different areas. And you might see bacterial community discrepancies in different areas as well. So the key is you have to be aware and monitor your methane generation if you can in these cases and keep close track of how the lagoon is running because you have a difficulty with getting the waste substrate in contact with all of the bacteria that are required to produce the uh, digestion. But again, they still offer effective treatment in many cases, and you save a lot of money up front, which can be beneficial in a lot of cases, especially if you're not going to have much greater benefits from the lagoons or from a complete mix system in some cases. All right, next we have the UASBs, which we've run into a number of these lately. Um, so these are very efficient at treating high levels of soluble COD. I've seen some in like soda manufacturing and things like that. They'll remove a lot of carbon very quickly. And you have a lot of control over what your HRT is uh, because you can recirculate the waste stream through the basin as much as you want in a lot of cases. And of course, this recirculation speed has some influence on in how granules are forming. However, you're unable to treat high solids waste streams with these efficiently. The high solids can become integrated in the granules in a UASB system, which reduces the density of the granules, and it can cause some of them to float and break up in the system. And when you start losing your granules, your UASB process starts to work very poorly. The other thing is these are very slow to start up because the entire function of the UASBs is designed to form granules. So you need a specific upflow rate and you need plenty of time for these bacteria to begin to stick together and not be washed out. And eventually they'll work up to being bigger and bigger granules until you have granules which are large enough for your system's needs. And every time these granules get messed up, you end up having to either start from scratch or getting in a bunch of seed granules from another site, which can be more difficult than sourcing something like regular anaerobic sludge. So I did want to make a few additional quick notes on UASBs because we get a lot of these questions and they're very difficult to answer from our standpoint because effective parameters for operating USB vary significantly due to the waste stream in question. Uh, there's a wide range of upflow rates required to get the granules to form properly. I found some values in literature and a number of sources that were kind of coming up, like 0.31 to 0.46 being kind of typical. And in, dust, in some industries have about 1.5 meter per hour as an upflow rate. I think that's that's a question best left to the engineer who's designing the process specifically for that waste stream because ultimately if you don't have a proper flow rate in your UASB you aren't going to be able to form granules which are large enough to perform effective treatment so you have to be well aware of what the requirements are. Um, the higher the upflow rate generally the larger the granules will become because you'll be washing out everything that's lighter and reseeding granules like I said is difficult because these systems aren't quite as prevalent as something like a complete mixed system and it's just kind of difficult to get the anaerobic seed sludge. And if you think about it from the other uh, digester perspective, I mean, it took them a while to grow their seed sludge. They might want to keep as much in their system as they can, though eventually some people are going to develop excess. So I want to go over a bit of the helpful testing for maintaining anaerobic digestion efficiently. Uh, biogas quantity is dependent on the substrate and be proportionate to loading. Uh, this can vary somewhat from system to system, but you'll see Generally speaking, biogas above 60% is considered pretty good. In some cases, you'll see above 70%, but that starts to become pretty rare. And if you're below 60%, you can be pretty confident you have a problem. In addition, it's nice to keep a quant. If you have a plant where you torch methane sometimes, or you have close to continuous monitoring of the biogas, that is the most efficient way to operate a plant because fluctuations in biogas occur before major upsets happen. So you will see the biogas dip a little bit and you might be able to perform steps to address it before an upset occurs. You're going to have a lot of discrepancy in the quality depending on the substrate and then some plants care more about it than others just by virtue of whether they are using their methane. Some plants will just torch the methane 
The torch color is still, of course, a good indicator. If you're seeing an orange flame, you can be reasonably sure your digester is struggling on your methane torch, but it's kind of nice to see people uh, using the methane whenever they can to generate electricity. Another test I generally push quite a bit is volatile acid to alkalinity testing. Uh, there are a number of standard methods you can look up for performing this testing. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask about it at the end of the presentation. But generally, an ideal volatile acid to alkalinity ratio would be below 0.34, so 0.34 parts volatile acid to alkalinity, but you really want it to be closer to 0.1. If you go a lot below 0.1, it may be an indication you have problems with inefficient hydrolysis occurring, which means you might have a lot of undigested substrate in your system. And when it starts to get above 0.34, you're getting to be in a very precarious position where you could have a rapid uh, loss of uh, lowering of pH in your digester and a major upset and a lot of foaming problems. So keep an eye on this. Um, a lot of people would, it's best to measure it daily even uh, as much as you can because it is a really good indicator of having an upset being about to happen. And for example, if you noticed your volatile acid starting to spike, you could start adding some sort of um, base or buffering agent like sodium bicarbonate to uh, improve that ratio and prevent a souring of the digester because once the pH drops in the digester, it turns into a real mess. So a couple other things which I like to look into, fatty acid analysis, we've done a lot of work with uh, over the past few years. Um, fatty acid analysis will give you a speciation of all the long and short chain fatty acids in the system, and this can be used as an effective diagnostic tool uh, to determine where you may be having a holdup in your anaerobic digester. So if you see a lot of really long chain fatty acids, this might be an indication that some of your hydrolysis is not happening as efficiently as possible. So maybe your mixing isn't working as well as it should be or that kind of thing. If you're noticing a lot of shorter chain fatty acids, particularly the shortest few like propionic and butyric and mainly acetic acid, you're going to be noticing souring in your digester in a lot of these cases. And this would mean your methane producers are really struggling to keep up with the acid production step in the process. So taking steps to adjust those as best as possible, which means if you have an issue with your short chains not metabolizing, that might be an indication that you need a trace element supplement. It might just be a matter of your waste stream might be fluctuating a little bit too much for the methanogens to keep up with effectively, which could be a major problem, but it's something that you'd at least be aware of at that point. So um, metals analysis, I talked about this already, but look for soluble versus insoluble metals. Um, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. So one of the methods is just using a centrifuge to centrifuge out the heavier solids, and then you take a supernatant filt um, sample to run the metal analysis on that will also work. And influent loading measurements are always important. You want to be keeping an eye on COD, nitrogen, and phosphorus to look for fluctuation. And if there's any way to communicate with upstream sources of high COD loading or something like that, in order to get them to level out their flow a little bit so they don't mess up your system in some of these plants, that could be beneficial. But it gives you some information for tracking your loading, which is really nice. And occasionally you will see issues with something like nitrogen or phosphorus deficiency. And those can usually be supplemented efficiently. So problems occurring in an anaerobic digester, you have acidification, loss of biogas toxicity, and then some major ones, sludge volume expansion and foaming. So acidification is when volatile acids increase in the anaerobic digester to the point where the pH drops in the digester. and once the pH begins to drop, especially below 6.5, methane production becomes very reduced. And once the pH drops below 6, you have very little methane production. So at that point, your acid formers are still working fine, and your methanogens are sitting there doing nothing and possibly dying, depending on what's going on exactly. But that allows you to pool up more and more volatile acids in your system. Um, so generally, most of that buildup at first is acetic acid, and as you get to the 4.5-ish pH, you start to see an increase of butyric and propionic acid in your anaerobic digester. Uh, typically, when the pH is in this range, it requires a massive amount of base to be added because 
the acid present is no longer proportionate in any way to the pH present. You're in a buffered region by acetic acid, which means you might need to use hundreds of times more titrated base to get the pH to increase. Once the pH approaches 5.5, you're getting out of that acetic acid buffered region, which means the pH will become less stable suddenly, which you need to be especially careful with if you're using a stronger base because the pH can almost immediately shoot up to above nine and that can cause a lot of trauma for your anaerobic system. So loss of biogas production, that's a very general symptom. I'm not gonna go in a ton of different detail here, but the doubling rate of methanogens is about 28 days, which means if you have an upset that affects your methanogens or you lose a bunch of your methanogen population for some reason, they take a long time to come back. However, luckily, a lot of the times they aren't going to be totally dying off. They're going to be becoming inert. But you can often supplement with a new digester sludge to start to rebuild your methanogens more quickly. Usually this will precede acidification in a digester. So toxicity, I mentioned a couple of these things earlier. Trace element toxicity. Routinely, if soluble levels of trace metals are greater than one or two ppm, they can start to become toxic in an anaerobic digester, which means the more trace metals you'll add, the more you'll actually be inhibiting your system. So that would be a risk associated primarily with trace element supplements. Occasionally, you might have a waste stream which has too much of these trace metals. And if that's uh, noted, your system may be able to acclimate to having high levels of trace metals present, or it may not be, but it's good to have that data so you can look at your system and make proper adjustments to be able to deal with different levels of trace metals present if you have no control over having excess trace metals. Salts is an important one to go over, dominantly because of people using sodium hydroxide and sodium bicarbonate for almost all of the pH adjustment taking place in anaerobic digesters. I guess a lot of people use magnesium hydroxide and things like that to get around it. But sodium can accumulate to toxic levels, particularly in a pH adjustment standpoint, which means it's better to use a blend of different uh, metal ion salts if you're going to be adjusting the pH. So maybe blend in some potassium bicarbonate or calcium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide with your sodium based uh, titrants to make sure that you're not overloading your system with sodium because if you have a system that's already upset and then you add a bunch of something it doesn't like to it, it's not going to recover any faster. However, sodium is something digesters have been known to acclimate to. So if you have a waste stream that's relatively high in sodium, there's a good chance your digester will be okay in the long run. Ammonia, I talked about this before, but it is toxic at around 50 parts per million. I found in literature, I think that was from Girardi's anaerobic digester book. Um, but 50 ppm is not that high a concentration, and you'll regularly see over 1,000 parts per million of ammonium, which is NH4+, as opposed to NH3 here, in your digester. If you have 1,000 parts per million of ammonium, your digester may be totally fine and happy to deal with it, but as your pH begins to increase, more of this will be converting to ammonia, particularly above pH 7.5, and it'll get really bad once it's above 8 but nobody really runs their digester at pH 8 anyway. But just be aware of your ammonium concentrations in your digester because you're going to be, well, it's good to measure this because you can develop toxic levels of ammonia fairly quickly. So something we've come in uh, contact with recently is a number of digesters that have had problems with foaming or sludge volume expansion. Now, foaming is discussed all the time, Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with it, where you have gas entrapped at the surface of your digester in a liquid matrix. The surface en uh, tension is reduced through some sort of surfactant action, and you'll get a lot of bubbles forming, which can cause a lot of problems with gas collection, and it can overflow and cover your plant, and it can be a real mess uh, if you have a foaming issue. But sludge volume expansion is a similar problem, but is a problem that tends to happen when people reduce mixing in order to combat foaming. And sludge volume expansion is referring to bubbles forming mid-column in your anaerobic digester, which can inflate the volume of sludge in the digester and cause similar problems to foaming, but be more substantial and more difficult to collapse. Like a defoamer isn't going to work great on sludge volume expansion in many cases. It may work, it may be worth a try, but you don't know for sure, and it's less likely to work than a traditional foam. So 
here's a general idea of how foam formation works in an anaerobic digester. Uh, you have a very stable foam in this middle section because you have a combination of gas production, solids, and surfactants. A couple key surfactants in anaerobic digesters are volatile acids and alkalinity, which in low concentrations don't really do anything as a surfactant, but in anaerobic digesters routinely have high concentrations. We're talking above 1,000 ppm. That reduces the surface tension at the top of your digester and makes foaming more likely. Solids content in an anaerobic digester, which could include filamentous bacteria, is another factor which can influence the stability of foam substantially. So if you have higher solids content, foaming is more likely because a lot of solids are going to be mixed in that matrix at the surface of the digester, and you're more likely to have foaming occur. Uh, most of the times when we see a lot of foam production, it's because biogas production shut off for a little while, like we were discussing before. Volatile acids built up, so you end up having a reduced surface tension in the digester, and then the methanogens begin to recover and produce a lot of biogas, and they can start to make your digester overflow. So if you're performing a pH adjustment, it's best to have some defoamer on hand to prevent this process from occurring. And you may be, want to be aware of your mixing because this may be a case where sometimes intermittent mixing could be beneficial to prevent foaming. So here's just a quick diagram of surfactants. Uh, generally speaking, when you're talking about a surfactant, you'd be talking about this top category where you have an amphiphatic compound such as a soap, which interferes with hydrogen bonding at the surface of the water. Hydrogen bonding is what produces surface tension. As you have more interference with this hydrogen bonding, your surface tension increasing and foaming becomes progressively more likely. So here we have a little diagram where you have foaming occurs. You could have filaments. You're going to have a lot of biogas being trapped in surfactants. You're going to have a lot of solids. And the more of these you have, the thicker your foam will be and the harder it will be to correct foaming problems. So what can cause a foaming event? It can be really hard to diagnose in many cases. Probably the most common ones are changes in loading. Uh, so you happen to have a bunch of grease dumped into your plant or something leading to some acid formation. Or a temperature change occurring, which happens a lot here in Wisconsin where people's uh, heating might not be working quite as well as it needs to to be able to get through keeping their digester at a steady 95 or so degrees Fahrenheit throughout all the winter. And temperature may drop, you know, from 60 degrees to 30 degrees outside fairly quickly and your heating has to be able to compensate for that. So if you have either of those, you get the volatile acid back uh, buildup we were talking about, which will lead to foaming. So something we've been asked about quite a bit is filaments and anaerobic digesters. Um, we've had a lot of people check for filaments and have us do microscopic analysis on anaerobic digester samples which are not connected to an activated sludge process or aerobic treatment in any way. And it's very unlikely that filaments will be forming in those cases. Filaments are almost all the ones that are going to be causing problems in wastewater. Um, they are strict aerobes, which means they cannot survive in anaerobic conditions. However, once they are fed into the digester, like I stated previously, they can take a long time to degrade and they will perform roles for stabilizing foam. So here's a couple times we have had foam show up in anaerobic digesters. This is Microthrix parvicella on the left. This top uh, photo is it from their aerobic treatment process, and then the bottom is from their anaerobic treatment process. We were looking at the filaments, and you can see there's quite a lot there. Like this picture was fairly representative of their digester. If you're feeding all this microthrix into your anaerobic digester, it'll go there, but it can start to become difficult to diagnose what filament this is because you can see, for example, microthrix has this very strong gram stain reaction where it becomes this dark, dark purple on this top photo. Whereas on the bottom photo, um, anaerobic toxicity, like I said, these are strict aerobes. Uh, you're seeing that the staining properties of this is declining, and these are not staining nearly as strongly gram positive as they were before. Also, the cells are starting to be visible. The cells are physically changing in shape as the filament is dying. Now, typically staining and morphological characteristics are how filaments are identified through microanalysis, which means if you're messing with the form of the filaments through toxicity, they become a lot more difficult to identify. That means if you have a waste-activated sludge process and you're concerned about foaming in your anaerobic digester, if you just send the anaerobic digester, it's very likely that whoever looks at it will say, 
you've got filaments in there, but we don't know what they are. Or they might guess what they are, but they won't be sure. If you send them some of their waste act, your waste-activated sludge too, then they can compare the two and make a much more informed decision on what sort of filament is likely to be there. So here's some more Microthrix Parvacella close-up views. This is Nizer staining, another stain where you can see anaerobic conditions made it so it doesn't really have these Nizer positive speckles out throughout the filament. So instead, you're kind of just seeing a little bit puffy cells which don't have any distinct Nizer staining characteristics. So the only reason I was able to be sure this was Microthrix Parvacella here is because they had a lot of Microthrix Parvacella in their waste stream and I was able to compare and quantify the two. And this was a plant that was having foaming events in the winter and they were frequently a little bit confused about it. So filaments will lead to increased foaming and you can usually take a look at this if you're having problems with waste activated sludge. When you feed the waste activated sludge, you'll see an uptick in foaming and you can get a sense for, oh, the waste activated sludge may be causing a problem here. So then you can feed a little bit of defoamer and you may have to lower the rate you're feeding activated sludge depending on what your restrictions are on your site. Levels of filaments do not need to be exceptionally high to contribute to foaming in anaerobic digesters as the solids content are very high, which means they're already taking up a lot of space. Filaments tend to increase the amount of space the solids are taking up and make it a more cohesive uh, solids matrix, which means the more solids, the less filaments you need. This is true in aerobic processes too, but it's not what we're talking about today. Filaments can survive for as long as a month in anaerobic digesters, and this has been studied in a number of cases. Um, particularly microthrix is known to survive as much of the month. Different filaments will survive different amounts of time. I've occasionally seen a filament that looks like H. hydrosis, which is a low DO filament, uh, hang around in a digester for quite a while. But again, it was a case where I wasn't able to make a real definitive diagnostic because we weren't really seeing um, any samples, or a sample from the waste activated sludge did not appear to be completely representative of the anaerobic sample. All right, so upsets in anaerobic digesters, wanna talk a bit about these things as well. So preventing an upset in an anaerobic digester, monitoring is the key. You wanna look at biogas production and volatile acid and alkalinity as much as you can in your anaerobic system because any fluctuations in these can precede an upset and it'll keep you on your toes and you can start doing things like feeding an alkalinity supplement like sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, something like Boost and Lock. Our Boost and Lock product produces good buffering capacity. We've actually blended it to avoid the issues with too much sodium present in it. So we have it blended with a couple of other um, bases and it seems to work pretty well in these cases. Uh, once the pH changes, you're too late to easily correct the problem, but the problem still needs to be corrected, which means if your pH changes, you're gonna to want to begin bringing the pH as up as quickly as possible. It's nice if you can get this before the pH drops below six because then you're avoiding the buffered zone and you'll need a lot less titrant, which is something like sodium hydroxide or any other base uh, to raise the pH back up. Consistent anaerobic loading helps to reduce the risk of upset, but obviously this is only, the control of this is somewhat limited from plant to plant. So again, it's important to monitor the loading, and if you notice there's sources of loading entering your system, which fluctuate a lot, there's a couple things you can do. One of which is feeding something like anaerobic food supplements, something we produce to help stabilize the loading. Basically, that'll just keep your methanogens active as the loading is lower in your system, which means they'll be more ready to handle higher loading at different times. Um, but if you can do something with your waste stream, like something mechanical, you could construct an EQ tank. If you could get somebody upstream to feed their waste stream to you more slowly so it's less likely to overload your system all at once, that kind of thing. There's a couple preventative methods you can work with to avoid having fluctuations in loading. Monitoring trace elements is also helpful so you can be certain you have relatively healthy levels of trace elements. Uh, of course, these are relatively easy to supplement. You could use our biogas one in a lot of cases. Otherwise, there are custom blends, which would be more useful for some industrial processes. Um, but yeah, if you monitor these, you can at least see if something looks a little off, you can take a guess as to how to correct it. And then that might be able to prevent a future upset from occurring before the issue gets really bad. Uh, in municipal systems, slow monitoring, it, and careful 
slow and careful loading is really important and you want to be cautious of how much waste activated sludge you're feeding. And regular digester cleaning, sometimes people will forget about this and it'll be 30 years since their digester is clean and they'll find out they're working with like a third of their digester capacity at that point because the digester is basically filled up with grit. So you want to be aware if it's been a really long time since you've cleaned your digester and you're having issues which can't be explained otherwise, it may be a good time to get in there and clean your digester. So when you're correcting an upset, you want to make small changes to move in the correct direction. And something like defoamer can help with this to mediate foaming as you're making the adjustments, because sometimes these adjustments can take a long time. Otherwise, you can actually make the problems worse. For example, temperature, you don't really want to change the temperature of your process more than one to two degrees Fahrenheit per day. If you increase the temperature faster than that, you probably are going to mess up your system more than it was messed up to begin with. So your temperature is going to drop off quickly, but you just have to be patient and bring it back up slowly. Of course, when you're correcting an upset, acquiring sludge is often an efficient method to deal with it. So pH adjustments and alkalinity. Uh, for large pH adjustments, be careful to avoid overjusting once the pH is 5.5. We talked about that before. You're getting out of that acetic acid buffered region, which means your acid, uh, your addition of acid will become more proportional to the pH changes you're seeing. So where 1,000 pounds, when you're at pH 5 of sodium bicarbonate, might have only raised the pH 0.1 in your system, it'll make a bigger change, substantially bigger, if you're outside of this buffered range. So you might see the pH suddenly jump from 5.5 to 6.5. For large adjustments, we usually just recommend something cheap like mag hydroxide. It cannot be ideal in some cases, but in a lot of cases, it's easy to supply a lot of it. You can get it in a slurry. It's not likely to over-adjust the pH because its solubility becomes rather low once you go close to pH 8. Uh, caustic soda is effective for large pH adjustments, but can cause these major pH spikes. But at least it is lower levels of solids you're feeding in the system if you're concerned about it. Uh, once the pH gets above 6, we recommend blending in something like our boost and lock. Bicarbonates would be okay. Um, and the idea is once you start supplementing more stabilizing uh, buffering component like a bicarbonate, bicarbonate tends to buffer between pH 7 and 8. You're preventing an over-adjustment in pH, so you don't have to worry about shooting up to pH 9. So here's Boost and Lock. Uh, it's an alkalinity supplement we developed to avoid the sodium issue we've been seeing in a lot of cases. It has a really good buffering capacity. It's a little bit, it's more of a complex blend than something just like sodium bicarbonate. So you can avoid the sodium toxicity, you can promote a stable pH, and it will make pH adjustments a little bit faster than something like a bicarbonate as well. We don't necessarily recommend it for huge pH adjustments, but certainly for smaller pH adjustments, like once you're above pH 6, or if you want a supplement to keep a stable pH in your system, it's a good one to add. Uh, another product which could be helpful in a lot of these upset cases is Quicksime L. Now, this is a biogas product designed to encourage more rapid breakdown of fats, greases, and oils. This may be very effective in something like an anaerobic lagoon if you have an accumulation of fats which need to be converted into soluble compounds more efficiently. But in a lot of systems, you could have a potential holdup where hydrolysis isn't taking place fast enough. So you have a lot of long chain fats in your digester which need to be broken down and Quicksime L will help to do this. This is also used often for foaming filament treatment in aerobic processes. So if you have a waste activated sludge system with a foaming filament, you can apply this treatment to the waste activated sludge process in order to prevent um, filaments from entering your anaerobic process and causing foaming. This will generally improve the fat degradation in anaerobic systems. So next we have the anaerobic food supplement. I mentioned this a bit earlier. This is a product that helps stabilize the waste stream in your anaerobic digester. When you add it to a system that has variable loading, you can it's feeding the methanogens specifically so it should maintain a more active community of methanogens. For example, if you had an industry that didn't have much loading over the weekend or something, it could be supplemented for the weekend, keeping your methanogens active. So when you come back the next week, you won't be as likely to have an upset. Uh, also, if you are starting up a system, this product can be effective to increase the growth rate of methanogens because you might be having slower hydrolysis and things like that occurring earlier in the process. And it can kind of give your methanogens a leg up. So quickly going through an example here, 
we had this Wisconsin plant which was having foaming problems during the winter. So what would be causing this foaming during the winter and how do you identify the problem? So we started out, we looked at the sample, we performed microanalysis. We noticed quite a bit of filaments in their anaerobic sample here. We weren't able to identify them very definitively, but in their mixed liquor sample, we were noticing that this appeared to be almost entirely Microthrix parvicella, which makes sense because Microthrix parvicella likes cold temperatures anyway. But their mixed liquor sample really didn't look that bad. It was still, their process was functioning okay. They were just having a bit of foaming but they were having major foaming in their anaerobic digester. So we thought, well, maybe the filaments are doing it. So we started the treating the filaments and it looked like it was helping a little bit, but in fact, it was still, they were still having major foaming in one of their two digesters and they thought they should have both been the same. So they were really confused about this. So we looked into it further and we were confused for months and we found out that there was actually a malfunction in the valve that was splitting the flow between the two digesters and they were really overloading solids to one digester and really underloading solids in the next digester. And basically the issue was just overloading in one of the digesters and high solids content makes foaming more likely. So even performing a diagnostic like this, sometimes you don't have enough information to be able to make an accurate determination of what the foaming cause is. But something like this, looking out for filaments, is still helpful. All right, so now I'm open to any questions, if anybody has any. But what is the shelf life of Biogas 1? There is no specific shelf life to that product. Uh, it might precipitate a little bit, but it's it doesn't have an active biological component in it, so it isn't going to go bad over time. Uh, do you have a product that can mitigate the effects of quats and sanitizers? That is unknown at this time. We're working with our counterquat product to see if anybody, um, to see how that's working, but it's really early in trials. It's still more designed for aerobic processes, but we'll kind of see. Uh, anaerobic uh, food supplement can help negate the effects of quats somewhat by growing a healthier methanogen set. Um, let's see. So manure, yeah, manure is a good option for seed sludge. Um, I think that it tends to be the best option if you don't have another plant similar. Can a digester be restored once disturbed? Yeah, it, it will depend a lot on what's causing the problem, but you know, there's a lot of things. Mostly we'll see adjusting the pH. But I hope you all have a nice rest of your day and feel free to email me if you have any questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.